Could you do me a quick favor if you're listening to this, please hit the follow or subscribe button. It helps more than you know. And we invite subscribers in every month to watch the show in person. People know Jack, mate, for being the guy to slag stuff off and that's funny. And then when the content dried up, well, I've now got to go and look for someone who's doing something wrong. You can only do that for so long before you just hate yourself. Didn't really get on with my mum. She would do and say things that I don't think any mum should really do. Things would happen at home and I'd have like a mark on my face, like from someone that shouldn't have given me that mark. I made a video reacting to so well as advent calendar. Like that changed the game for me and the, the upload before that, I was gonna quit. I struggle with um, health anxiety and OCD. There's probably 15 to 20 times a day where I actually convince myself that I have cancer. So you're too fearful to go and get a health check done? If I go there and the doctor's like, yeah, you're ill, then that's the end for me. What do you mean that's the end for you? Jack, give me the uh, give me the context on your life. You know, I, I sat here yesterday with Israel Adesanya, and he told me about his childhood, um, and there was hints of that that really kind of felt similar to the experience that I read you've had as as a young man as well. And then also, I think the other one where I could see real distinct similarities, and I think you might have listened to this podcast, is Jimmy Carr. Yeah, yeah, what a man. Yeah, what a man, right? Mm. I, he's like, a, I didn't realize he was he was going to be such a philosopher. One of the things he said to me was, you know, when someone d becomes a comedic figure, which I consider you to be in many respects. Mm -hmm. I think I'll you take are. that. Yeah, good. I'll okay. Take that. Um, he, he says that instead of asking, because there's, you know, there's this kind of stereotype that the person themselves is struggling with something and they're trying to make other people laugh. He said to me, as you might've heard, he said, you've actually got to ask them which one of their parents they were trying to please or to, to make happy. Does that resonate with you at all? Um, yeah. I mean, upbringing didn't really get on with my mum. I don't think she truly understood the potential in YouTube. Whereas my dad always did. So when I was sort of like, like we're, I guess, how old are you, Steve? 29. 29. Okay, so I'm 29 in like two weeks' time. So right. like we we were kind of like the first kind of content creators in a way. Like we we kind of like paved the way, if you will. Some you people did. did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was late to the party. But... Well, people like Charlie are so cool like did. Yeah. And I just followed them, I guess. But um, yeah, my mum didn't really get, she might, she might argue this point, I don't know. But I don't think she really saw the... Um, the potential in what I was doing. So I was just some kid in my bedroom, just talking to a camera, just waffling, not getting a real job sort of thing. And um, she has she has her issues and stuff with alcohol and whatnot. Ended up kicking me out. Long story short, um, I was kind of at a crossroads at some point, quite early on, maybe like 18, 19, where I was living in my uncle's box room at his, at his um, flat, which isn't the nicest environment in the world. I, I think you wouldn't mind me saying. And then I kind of thought, okay, I have to try and take this YouTube shit serious. And at that time, I didn't know what the YouTube shit was. So ever since that moment, I think the pivotal moment for me was I bought a whiteboard. I bought a whiteboard and that changed <laughs> it. That, yeah, that, that changed everything. And because I never took YouTube serious, like a job, like a nine to five. It was always something that I would just just do, just, mm. just moan about something or take a, do a funny take on something or whatever. So I bought a whiteboard chopped it up into a month and wrote my plan. And then I think it was in like 2012, I had this thing where I was like, I'm just gonna say yes to anything that comes in my inbox. And mm. I just, for 365 days, just did. And then ever since then, it's just felt like I'm on this weird kind of, like I've still not worked it out. Like you've got your shit together, Steve. No, I haven't. <laughs> no, I haven't. Look how many cameras there are. <laughs> 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 it doesn't, I think cameras isn't, uh, yeah, an indication of having my shit together, but I, okay. I You're a the, dragon. The, it's mad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just the word dragon. Like that's mental. It is, it is crazy. <laughs> You've just reminded me of how much I resonated with what you were saying, because I had a really, um, what's the right word? I had a, a real issue with the fact that my mother was so different. Right. And so challenging at times like mm -hmm. as i write about in my book showing up to my school in her lingerie when i was maybe seven years old yeah and things like that like, right re and, it, and i've always really wanted to have a normal family and a normal mother and yeah that kind of thing and i kind of i kind of got that from reading your stuff and there's a couple of things where you talk about some of the challenges she, you think she has mm -hmm. which i also think my mother has oh wow really yes. she's actually started to talk a little bit about that yeah um yeah, my, sorry. My, yeah, I don't know if my mum's ever been diagnosed with it. Um, 
because there's always been kind of like rumors and that that that's the case and i've because i've not been a part of her life in the past like eight nine years i don't know oh you haven't no not really i see her at like my nans at christmas time and stuff but there's always a very awkward kind of vibe where now it's kind of just like, at, like nodding terms and for someone who's your mum that's a weird that's a weird thing to be yeah it's just it's just yeah growing up it's just you, you hit the nail on the head there when you said about your mum like she would do and say things that I don't think any mum should really do and it's hard now because at what point do you at what point is it water under the bridge like yeah. at what point do you go okay I'm just gonna make up with her sounds very like juvenile and stuff but when so much has happened in your past how when is the day when you go okay I'll accept you again now and she sees that because she'll text me every now and then but my worry is that because she's always struggled with alcoholism she'll text me at half 11 on a Saturday night I want to get that text message at 10 30 on a Tuesday morning mm. I don't want to get it at 11 30 on a Saturday night mm. so I won't reply and then she'll just assume that there's a lot of animosity still there and I guess there is but yeah it's funny because I sat here actually, I think yesterday with my sister and I don't see my sister much. I think I see my sister once a year. Right. And my sister really wants me to kind of like reconnect with my mum and like get back on good terms with her. But um, for the exact, for the, I think it sounds like pretty similar reasons to you. I was trying to explain to my sister that like, I need to have boundaries with everybody in my life, not just like my friends, but also with my family. And it, at, at some point you've got to protect yourself yeah. from going back around the fucking... Yeah. You know, like taking them back in, forgiving them for whatever they might have done for you, mm -hmm. done to you, and then getting sucked back in because, you know, you're, you've fallen for this trick once almost. Yeah. Oh, mate, I've fallen yeah. for it too many times. Yeah. And, and I really got my life together and I started on this kind of trajectory where I am now once I left home. That was when it was kind of like, okay, you need to make this work or you, you're, you're just done. You're just in your uncle's box room forever sort of thing. So if it weren't for my mum, I wouldn't have bought that whiteboard. Yeah, what a pivotal moment. Yeah. And what about your dad? I, I heard that story about watching the World Cup and that was... Yeah, my, my dad's quality. My dad is quality because he's been through a lot of stuff in his life. So I don't know if you know, but my dad went to prison for manslaughter when he was young, very young. Um, yeah, got in, a, got in a fight with... Um, with with some some bloke outside a pub got in a in a di in a dispute and uh, hit him and the guy fell and and passed away, and that plagues my dad now because they're just two kids fighting in a in a in a pub car park like so he went to prison, he came out and he's just he's just a grafter like that pains him inside he has to live every day with that obviously it's not right what he did but um I'm never I'm never gonna say that but he's brought me up with a lot of morals and. It's taught me if you ever get in any fights, like you run away, like you don't need to be the big man like like he was. And he's always had my back from day one and he's he's like my best mate. So for example, like when I first got my my first YouTube check through, I think it was like $60 was like the threshold that you had to get back in the day. Mm. And I think I got paid, so it was like 45 quid or something. And um, I, I'm, from a, I'm from a council estate, never had any money. <clears throat> and I got that 45 pounds. And instead of giving my mum any money, I just went to Top Man, bought some T-shirts. Like, you remember them old sort of T-shirts with the yes, colour? Yes, <laughs> with the little buttons down here. That, oh my God, I wanted every colour. Yeah, and it was yeah. like the collar was different colour to the top. Yeah, and, and the buttons were different colours. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I got a couple of those and um, I, was, I was in my room and I remember my mum coming in and having a go and being like, oh, you should give me like half of that or whatever. And then she went, and you've just wasted it on fucking T-shirts. And I had done that. That is literally what I'd bought. But my dad, I remember my dad coming in and going, he needs those t-shirts because he can't be wearing the same stuff in all of his videos. Mm. And it was like, he didn't know if that was why I was buying them or not. But, <laughs> but like he, he'd literally just made up a reason to, to apply it to my YouTube channel and justified why I was, like, why did I have to justify at that age why I'm buying t-shirts? Yeah, but yeah. my dad just knew from the off. I, I guess none of us really knew the potential in YouTube back in the day. We were all just sort of testing the waters and just having fun. But I feel like my dad kind of had an idea that I, he, he, he trusted that I, saw something in it even if he didn't so i owe him a lot in that respect and now when i see him if i've been doing good in my life bad in my life if i've yeah i'll tell him everything and he'll just give me the best advice ever and yeah it's just i'm glad i had him because he was very much the the counterweight i really vividly remember the moment when my dad called me to the kitchen table and basically said i don't love i don't love your mother right like i can almost um, remember what I was wearing. And I remember from reading about your story that there was a moment where your dad basically said, I'm going to leave after this football match. Yeah. Yeah. During the World Cup final, 2006, I think it was when Italy won on penalties and Sedan did that. Head yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So my mum would always kick him out 
Yeah, she'd always just, when she'd had enough, she'd kick him out. And it, it was very much a case of, I think my dad loved my mum more than my mum loved my dad. And my dad was, I think he'd admit he was like the the kind of like lap dog that would come running back. My mum would kick him out and he'd come back. And it'd be, I'd see it, I'd see it as a kid, like them having an argument. And he'd be kicked out so unfairly. Like, and I'd just, I wouldn't be able to work it out. But I kind of understood it because I was on the receiving end of that kind of judgment and, and stuff sometimes. So. I remember he would, all, she'd always kick him out and he'd go around his friends and I'd go and visit him at his friends. And again, he had a little box room as well and he hated it and he was a proper grafter working all the hours under the sun. So one day he just went, she's going to kick me out again and I'm, and I'm just gone. And then, and I'm just going to go. And, he, and it, luckily like he didn't travel to the other side of the world. He just went to a town 30, hmm. 30 minutes up the road. But yeah, we was watching a football game, World Cup, and I thought I better enjoy this because it's going to be different after this. And I think it was a bit different after that because I think if if home life was ever bad, he was always the one that I'd be able to chat to about it and that. And then after after that, it's a good job it was a good football game. Otherwise, that would have been shit, wouldn't it? Mm. Was, there, um, was there a point you got to where you kind of wanted your parents to separate? For Because I, I fought it for a long time and I was like, I remember crying my eyes out as a kid at the prospect of my parents separating. Mm. And then I remember, I think maybe getting to like 14 or 15, where I was like, I'd actually prefer you guys to not live in yeah. the same place. <laughs> yeah, I think that's accurate to me. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm just looking back and seeing it differently, but I don't think I gave a shit really when it happened. I think it, I'd, all, I'd always see them break up and get back together and oh. break up and get back together. And I think like, I'd see my dad like stay up all night writing my mum love notes and stuff. And she'd wake up and not, not be asked. Get, get rid of them and I'd see that side of it as a kid I don't think that should have been a side that I I did see necessarily um the the rejection from from her for someone that she's supposed to love so when he when he was gone I was kind of like yeah go fly oh, really? <laughs> yeah yeah and then he met his his new partner who's lovely and then ever since then that's been a little haven as well just going around there and just venting and stuff so did you ever figure out why why she was the way she is or did you ever try and figure it out was it like a generational thing that was her parents or something or something had happened to her i don't know because her mum my nan is the loveliest woman in the world so i see my nan all the time i've got her tattooed on me there mm. um so i don't know where it came from i just think she's had she just has or she had she might be completely different now but she definitely just had issues and i don't know whether that's drink drugs whatever that may be um maybe i haven't given her enough time to actually think about why she's like that really I don't know. And she's never had help or anything like that? Not that I, not as far as I know. Nah, not as far as I know. But my life has been richer and mentally I've been a lot healthier with, without her in my life, which sounds horrible. Um, but that's the, that's the truth of mm. it. Maybe one day we'll be able to sit down and talk it all, talk it all through. But mm. not, not today and probably not tomorrow. What about school? You in school, what were you like? Uh, just a little, I was quite short actually. Little ginger, um, twat really <laughs> i was all right i was all right <laughs> really? uh, yeah i just i would just show off to the cool kids i'd want to be i'd want to be accepted a lot so i'd show off to the cool kids and i remember i used to always like say what i think were funny little one-liners and not get a laugh and then once i put a ruler in a fan and it went and i got the biggest laugh ever and i thought what is this like what, what am i doing so i just became a bit of an idiot in the last few years and was just trying to make the the cool kids laugh. So a, there, there is a lot, lot of regret as, at, for how I was at school as well, because I wasn't a bully. I'd never say I was a bully, but I was a bit of a prick to teachers as well. And there was one teacher in particular, I'd just go in her class and I just wouldn't be asked and I would just never listen. And she'd try. I wonder if in a, in a weird way, like she'll stumble across this video. And uh, Miss Chapman was her name, English teacher. And I'd love to reconnect with her and just apologise because I, I mean, all, we all were, but that was no justification for me individually. But I was just a bit of a prick. I would never listen. And I guess being ginger and ev everyone's got things that people like get picked on for as a kid. But you, you try and you try and fit in. So I, I, I tried to fit in by being the, the class clown, the funny one. And that's such a cliche. And I hate when people say they were the class clown because mm. what that translates to is you were just a bit of a dickhead. Mm. And that's but that's what I was. So. Yeah, Miss Chapman, if you're if you're watching this, I apologise. You were great. I hope she is. Mm. 
I hope she is. Mm. Uh, was it just because you were ginger though and you were being picked on a little bit that you were trying to like find a way for them to <laughs> appreciate you? Was yeah. that, you think that was it? Yeah, I discovered bleach, uh, <laughs> bleached my hair. Oh, yeah. and then <laughs> I relaxed mine so it was straight. No, I'm just, I'm just cool with this short Afro thing. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah I, yeah, I discovered bleach and then I remember just going to school the next day, like that scene in Bruce Almighty where I'm like, look, Here you go, birds that's... are flying on me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was yeah I was a different person then um yeah and then and then but then I was predicted all the top grades like I was predicted like 12 GCSEs or whatever it was like top marks in everything and I just completely fucked it really and got like five just scraped it so um yeah I was a bit a bit of an idiot really I only sort of took life serious after school when thank god I found YouTube because god knows what I'd be doing if I didn't was was there a connection in, in your view when you look back between your home life and your school life? I think because you said it was it year ten or eleven. I can't remember that things kind of went downhill for you. I, I wondered if there was there was a link at what with in your mind of what was going on at home and what you know your school performance decline. Um, I, 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 maybe 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 I could I could sort of blame home life, but I I I, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably just say it was more a case of wanting to fit in discovering at an early age I wanted to be the funny one I've always been the center of attention as well or wanted to be the center of attention I should say so as soon as I discovered oh self-deprecating works and putting myself down works that gets a laugh I'll do that and then you're invincible then because if mm -hmm. people are calling you a ginger twat if you call yourself a ginger twat before them disarming yeah now yeah. I've got the cards <laughs> yeah yeah, so I don't think the home life, the, the home life, my home life affected school probably the early years in in high school because like, not to go into too much detail, but like things would happen at home, and I'd have like a mark on my face, like from someone that shouldn't have given me that mark, and I'd go to school and say the cat done it, and I didn't have a cat, <laughs> so so it's like that. Re I think that really affected me. There's little things as well. Like I remember like I had these ornaments. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. No, I don't think I've even seen the film, but I love these ornaments. And then I'd done something at home that was naughty or something. Stayed up too late or played the PlayStation too much. And then someone came in and threw the, threw the shelf down and smashed those ornaments. And I remember as the shelf was on the floor, I remember thinking, I was only a kid, I was probably like 10, right? And the shelf was on the floor. There's a big standing bookshelf. And I was, I, I remember thinking, please, please don't say those ornaments are broke. I, I love them for some reason. And I remember lifting it up and they were all broke. And that was the moment where I was kind of like, I fucking hate this shit. So I remember going to school and having to deal with stuff like that. Um, but in the, in the later years when I kind of had YouTube and found my feet a little bit more and who I wanted to be, I found it a bit easier, even if I was pissing the grades up the wall, so to mm. speak. Do you ever worry, because I, I, something I, as I've gotten older, I think as we get older, sometimes the like, some of the earlier things we learned about love or relationships or how you treat people or how you respond or your temper, they they can sometimes um, surface. And you, because I'd have moments where I'd see parts of my parents and myself that I maybe didn't love. Have you ever got seen glimmers of that home life that you think in yourself when you go, fuck, I don't want to be that person. That's that's such an amazing question. That is mm. like that's so. That me, me and my sister have discussed this as well because I have, I have, because I because I separated from my mum so to speak at quite an, quite an early age just after after school. I think I've lost all of the, her her traits that I had in me because they were such negatives to me. I really noticed them like her biggest negatives like stood out like a sore thumb. So I actively had to not take them on myself um whereas my sister she had a, she had quite a few of her, her my mum's negative um traits and we've spoken about this now as adults and she's like yeah I have to actively like whenever I think like mum would think or do something mum would do have to try and get rid of it I have a lot of my I give my dad all the credit I have so a, a lot of how I am is because of my dad but I also have my dad's negative traits as well which I think he would say and, and my dad not so much now but especially after what I told you about his upbringing he, he, anger was his thing so and I have I have that not luckily I have it under control it's never going to affect anyone else or hurt anyone else but like for example if I'm editing and the software shuts down I'm like fuck like I'm re like instantly I'm so angry inside and Fiona will have to be like Jack just chill the fuck out like this isn't that deep and then I'm like okay as long as I remember where I got this from and what if I can pinpoint it on something I'm a lot I'm a lot better um luckily that's never 
got me in, into any trouble. If, if I'm out and someone says anything to me, I, I don't get that. I get it through over trivial th- sort of right, like right, right. trivial things. But yeah, um, I definitely do have have some negative uh, traits about me from my parents. Have you ever gone to like therapy or spoken to anybody to try and understand these patterns or to spot them or anything? Or is it just from like self-reflection that you've noticed? Um, I did I did anger management classes at school. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, but for <laughs> they put me in them for something I didn't do. I remember walking in the library once and I was at the bottom of these stairs <laughs> and this guy just gets thrown down the stairs at my feet. And the teachers come in and seen it, and I had to do twelve weeks anger. I swear to, <laughs> I, pr- I promise you, I done a lot of like mad shit at school, but that was not one of them. I didn't know how I could throw him and then be down there before him. He was on my feet, so it didn't make sense. Um, so yeah, I remember doing twelve or six weeks anger management, um, but I kind of needed them. So even though I didn't actually throw him down, <laughs> says, I probably would have been the guy to maybe do that one day had right. I not had them. I can't remember anything we spoke about in those lessons, but yeah, that's the only time I've really debated it does it does it does it not ever crop up in in your professional work like anger issues with uh like colleagues or with i don't know with people no i think i think i've over the years i've mellowed out so much i've i think i've matured so much as well and i think that shines through in like my old kind of like main channel content because I made a name for myself on YouTube by being kind of like the anti-YouTuber yeah. and like slagging off other YouTubers. And But I, I remember turning on the camera and putting on such a fake anger because mm. I was talking about things I didn't care about. Mm. Oh, Ollie White's got some new 30 pound t-shirts. Let's moan about that. Mainly because I knew I'd get a million views from it. Not that I cared. So I got really good at turning the camera on and putting this kind of like faux like anger like fake ang- like i guess because i was pretending to be angry all the time mm. i was very alert when i actually was angry and i could keep that keep that under control so do you regret any of those videos as you've matured you say you've mellowed out and matured now and you, and you even spot that you were doing them from like a not an authentic place right do you regret them uh there's some i definitely do regret yeah the, the majority i'd say no um obviously we 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 both know that i'm a big fan of ricky gervais yeah and he always one of his mantras is there needs to be a why in comedy. Why are you doing something? If you're targeting someone, why are you doing it? Like, um, and a lot of my <clears throat> early main channel content, like for anyone who doesn't know, like I made a video reacting to um, Zoella's advent calendar. She- Everybody knows. <laughs> it's got like 6 million views, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, crazy. It did all right. That changed the game for me in terms of YouTube. I was I was going to quit. The, the, the upload before that, I was going to quit. And then I upload that video and it changed the game. But th- like when I look back on videos like that, I, I have no regrets because it was funny. It, the comedy almost like it wrote itself. Like there was a reason why I was doing it. It was, it was a sketch. That's all mm. it was. But there would be times when I fell into the trap of like, okay, people know Jack mate for being the guy to slag stuff off. And that's funny, whatever. And then I'd find a few things that naturally did piss me off and I could draw humor from it. And then when the content dried up, it was kind of like, well, I've now got to go and look for someone who's doing something wrong and become this kind of like sort of white knight of, of the internet sort of thing. And it was mm. like, it's never who I was. So I did, I, I did my first ever video with Ricky Gervais and, and, and that was the biggest moment ever for me. And then I remember uploading the video and the interview was brilliant. And the top comment was, this is good, Jack, but Ollie White's released some new t-shirts that you haven't spoken about. And I thought, fuck me. So I've got now, that's what you want from me. Is that, mm. So then I'd go, I'd then go out of my way to go, okay, Zoella in the title, Bangs Views. What is she up to? Oh, she's released a book. Now that book, there was nothing wrong with that book. But I'm trying, I'm tr- actively trying to pick flaws in it that I can dissect mm. on my channel. And it's like, there, that's kind of like the stuff I, I, I regret. I remember KSI and Joe Weller, they did their... When I was trying to be edgy boy, edgy boy Jack, mate, they did their first press conference for their fight. And that was in in Manchester, I think it was. And I, and and because I was the black sheep of YouTube, I would never get invited to them. Mm. So therefore, by default, the jealousy would take over. And I'd be like, this is shit. I want nothing to do with it. Where deep down, I knew that I wanted something to do with that. That whole YouTube boxing scene. It fa- I'm a boxing fan. I'm a YouTube fan. Mm. So why would that not appeal to me? Um, and they did, they did a press conference. And JJ, he... Um, he said something about Joe Weller's medication, 
which I don't agree with, but in the context of a press conference, you say anything you can to get the upper hand. Mm. And I remember just turning on my camera straight away. I was like, KSI needs to be cancelled, blah, blah, blah. Because I knew it would bang views. But JJ's a hero of mine, as I'm sure he is to mm. any YouTuber, any content creator. Mm. Joe Weller, I, was, I, I, I used to watch every single one of his videos. I, I love Joe Weller. So they're the ones I regret when I wasn't be, being authentic and not even really being funny, just actually trying to go in on someone because I wanted that check at the end of the, the ad revenue to be higher that month. When you were doing that, so when you, JJ, JJ mentioned the medication thing, you hit record. Mm. Was it like, I can make some money here or yeah. was it, I can make some money and get attention? Probably a bit of both. both. Yeah, because they go hand in hand, don't they? Especially, especially on YouTube. So probably a bit of both. Um, it's mad that you're so self-aware about this, like, and you're just like, you're really good at diagnosing exactly why you did it from like a psychological incentive perspective. You're like, I wanted this, or I did this. I wasn't true to myself. I did it. And it, and that suggests like you've done a lot of kind of reflecting and soul searching and maturing in what is actually a very short space of time. Mm. Cause this was only, this is not, you know, a lifetime. This is not a decade ago. That video was probably four and a half, five years ago. Yeah. Tops. Yeah. Yeah. It's cause it was, I, I realized a couple of years ago, it wasn't who I wanted to be. I was probably I, I I recently did a brand trip with Cal Freezy yep. and and the burnt um the burnt chip, and I was speaking to them out one night and I'd never done a trip with another YouTuber. I was always YouTubers are very clicky and they're all in their groups, um and I was always on the outside of that. I was always this boy from Norwich, just have my mm. normal mates and they surround themselves with YouTubers. And I remember saying to them one night, I think the main reason why I used to go for them is because I wanted to be them. I, I, I'm I'm one of the OGs. I really am. I've been doing YouTube for, probably around this the, to the the same month that JJ uploaded his first one. Like we would have been there at the start, and Cal Freezy, Calix, all of these lads, uh, Mini Minter, and I and I probably I see them become a collective. And I was like, why am I not part of that? Like, and now I don't give a shit. I'm so happy and content with where I'm at, and I've built my podcast now. And mm. but but as a as a kid, as a even as an 18, 19 year old young man grow, growing up, seeing that feeling left out, it probably goes back to how I was at school as well. I thought, okay, if 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 you if you can't join them, slag them off, become the mm. Darth Vader of YouTube, so to speak. Um, yeah, and then in recent years, people started to discover that other people that I really respected, like Will and E, people on you, and then even though Will was my friend, like still is my friend, like he'd call me out publicly when I'd be slagging someone off and go have a day off, mate. And I would be so angry because, because it was accurate. And I'm like, I'm sat there like, <laughs> so right. And I'm like, no, I'm not bothered, mate. Like that mm. kind of, that kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah. I was speaking to Cal Freezy about that. And yeah, I've got a lot, I've got nothing but respect for it for him now. My girlfriend came upstairs yesterday when I was having a shower and she said to me that she tried the Huel Protein Shake, which lives on my fridge over there. And she said, it's amazing. Low calories, you get your 20 odd grams of protein, you get your 26 vitamins and minerals, and it's nutritionally complete. In the protein space, there's lots of things, but it's hard to find something that is nice, especially when consumed just with water, and that is nutritionally complete, and that has about 100 calories in total, while also giving you your 20 grams of protein. If you haven't tried the Huel Protein product, do give it a try. The salted caramel one, if you put some ice cubes in it and you put it in a blender and you try it, is as good as pretty much any milkshake on the market, just mixed with water. It's been a game changer for me because I'm trying to drop my calorie intake and I'm trying to be a little bit more healthy with my diet. So this is where Huel fits in my life. Thank you, Huel, for making a product that I actually like. The salted caramel is my favorite. I've got the banana one here, which is the one my girlfriend likes, but for me, salted caramel is the one. You not only did the whole YouTube thing, but you also provided this like online commentary almost constantly about how you were feeling about it. So you are one of the, the sort of rare YouTubers that like in real time would say, I've lost motivation for this. I'm going to try and find my motivation for this. I've lost motivation for doing this kind of thing. I'm doing it. You know what I mean? And you were very open. So even for me, I, as I logged into Twitter, I could kind of see where you were on this journey. Mm. And obviously I've seen that change a lot with the, the whole podcast and the Spotify thing, which feels like you really found something that you do find like really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But with your main channel, I watch you go through these waves of enjoyment and then seeing you say, right, I'm going to try and commit to it now. And then that didn't really work. And then, so tell me about that journey with YouTube and, and what you learned about yourself from that. Oh God, it's, 
Really good questions. It's got to be said. Yeah. Like, wait till well, you no, come on my podcast well, no, and no, I ask you your favourite sandwich. I, I genuinely have watched it, and, I, and it, this is why I kept trying to, you know, message you like, come mm. on my podcast because mm. that watching that journey taught me so many things, and it really reconfirmed a lot about for me that I've been reading about in psychology about what keeps people motivated, and when they're not doing things that are in line with who they are, or whether they're doing it for a check. Mm. I remember reading this study which said if you love doing something, and then they pay you to do the exact same thing you lose your motivation. So the minute it goes from being a hobby I'm doing for the love of it to a hobby mm. that I love doing, but now someone is paying me for, there's this weird thing that happens in the mind where people lose motivation for the exact same thing. Go, I, go, yeah. Going off that, and I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I found this really interesting. I couldn't really work it out myself. I spent my whole YouTube kind of main channel era like, just saving up all my money, just saving up all my money. Like the only thing I was, I had the blinkers on. I was like, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. And last May, I paid for my house and bought it outright. Wow. And that was the last time, bar one, that was the last time I uploaded. Really? Yeah. yeah. It, it was like, it's called a rival fallacy, I think. Yeah, yeah, And Tyson yeah, yeah. Fury has ha, had it about um, when he beat Klitschko and became the heavyweight champion of the world. The next day he was depressed. Israel Adesanya sat there yesterday and said the same thing. Really? He said, the day after I won the UFC title, I went to my hotel room, I was depressed. Yeah. I said it last night on stage at the Palladium. I said 80% of Olympians, when they get the gold medal, they they report depressive symptoms. Yeah. It was the most proud proudest I've ever been over anything and paid paid it off. And then me and my partner, Fiona, we... We moved in in September and I just, I remember just, I was drunk one night and I remember just walking around my house when Fiona was asleep and I just, I just didn't care for the, for where I was. Like it's a beautiful house and I'm so lucky and it's everything I'd worked for. But it was like, what do I do now then? Like, what do I, where, like what? I'll sit on my sofa or go in, go in my kitchen. Like I just know I'm not any happier than when I was renting or, Mm. Like it, it was it was it was weird so have you figured out why you felt that way no i know i uh, nah i don't know i don't know it's it's because it's because the journey is way more fun than amen yeah than 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 the arrival that mm. it, it just it just is the, the the most fun i've ever had is probably the first time i got a viral video or the first time I got to present for this company or mm. first time I got a brand deal, do all the stereotypical YouTuber things. The first time mm. I felt like a YouTuber, they, they're the best moments. And it, I, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm not sitting here and whining and I'm so blessed and so lucky. And yeah, it's, it is a, it is a tough one. It's a tough one. But like I did my, my kind of like soundbite that I always sort of say is I did YouTube for seven years without earning a penny. Mm. And then, it, and then once the Zoella video p kicked off and the ad revenue went up and I earned money I would never, I could never dream of earning, that, that was no more fun than when I was doing it for, for free. And it's funny because the, the, I guess the, the liberating thing to know is that everyone I've sat here with says the same thing. Mm. So it's not a you thing, it's a mm. human thing. And so you go, okay, if it's a human thing, what does that mean and why is that? One of the things, because I was writing my show for the Palladium, I, I encountered was that the reason why we're here is because our ancestors struggled forward and their desire to keep striving is the reason they built these empires and overcame. So I say to the crowd, I say, is it conceivable that they left a message within our genetic code that says, you too shall struggle forward? And they've kind of like predisposed us to like forward motion. And also this other point, like the our ancestors, our ancestors that had a, a, a real sense of what really liked forward motion, struggle and purpose were the ones that survived and passed on their genes to us. So we're, we've, we've inherited this real desire to have forward motion and a sense of purpose. And one of the things they say is causing the life expectancy to decline in the Western world is specifically they, they, they point at men and say there's an epidemic of purposelessness as the world is starting to change and AI and things like this are, I'm pointing at the little robot that's moving, moving around the room on, on its own, are taking purpose from people. And so people are now becoming more addicted and depressed and therefore their suicide has become the single killer, biggest killer of men under the age of 45, which has caused the life expectancy to decline for two years in a row. And it's because of they think this epidemic of purposelessness. So when you lose your sense of purpose, 
because you reach the, the the point you're aiming for, that can be so disorientating and confusing as it was for me at 25 when someone came along and said, we'll buy a social chain off you for 50 million. And I go home and I look at the, the mansion on right move and the Lamborghini on auto trader and I feel totally fucking lost. I, com I completely, I completely agree. Like I, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's everything I've, I've always, always wanted. But like, cause, cause I, I think, I think money does, money does buy happiness. And I think if people say otherwise, I think they're talking shit. Like I, in, in a way, like, well, I, well, maybe I should rephrase that to, to money buys freedom. Yeah. And freedom is, is happiness. Is, is happiness. Yeah. And that's what, what I have now. I have, I can do what I want when I want. The best feeling I, I, I get now as a 28 year old, soon to be 29 year old is when I sort my family out mm. and like my granddaddy's still working. He's 20, he's 70, um, 77, 20. Imagine that he wishes. <laughs> <laughs> he's 70, he's 77. And he's a big fat lump from Norfolk and he still does building and demolition and walks on roofs and stuff. And he's not got a penny. And then like, I went to see his parents grave with him in February um, last year. And uh, he goes there every week, puts new flowers on. He's been doing it for like 50 years. And it's like, and I could see he was he, he was wearing these beat up boots and this disgusting tattered jacket. And I just went home and I just got his bank card without him knowing from his side of his car, where his handbrake is. And I got his bank and I just transferred him 5,000 pounds. And for me, that was like, that was just everything. That was like, that was a... Uh, everything I'd worked for was justified in that moment. And I got more out of that than I did when I bought my house. And like just little things like my sister's type one diabetic. So she has like a thing in her arm that constantly pricks her and finds her, her levels. And mm. I can, I can pay for that shit. And yet last night my dog died and the dog that I'd had for 18 years. Um, and uh, li literally like found out just before I went to sleep last night. And it's little things like this that might not seem like a lot, but it was the first time I'd spoke to my mum in ages and she was like, oh yeah, we're going to get Diddy's ashes, cost 200 pound. There's the 200 pounds. So it's like that kind of shit is like why I owe everything to this online world and people that have given up their time to watch me and brands that have trusted me and stuff. And yeah, that's the best feeling. I think you nailed it when you said that. Um, sorry about your dog, by the way. I have a dog <laughs> and I really, that really, I can't mm. imagine. It's shit, it's yeah. It's really shit. Even the thought of it is just... Yeah. terrifying she was 18 years and four months which is quite old mm. but when they get to that age you just assume that they're always gonna crack on yeah yeah mm. um no you i think you nailed it when you said that freedom is the thing that ultimately does make you happier because i remember not having i remember getting the bailiff letters and then not being not knowing how i was going to eat or knowing that the, the landlord was going to come and ask me why i hadn't paid the rent in four months and the pressure that of const that like weighing on me and the freedom of just like not looking at how much things cost when you go into top man and want to buy one of those t-shirts yeah that kind of thing or you want to go somewhere so freedom definitely makes you happier but obviously at this point i've come to realize that if you gave me more money, the, the fundamental happiness levers of my life won't change. Like, you're right. Like my sister's been a little bit sick recently. She, mm. she, um, um, and being able to help her, I said to my team this week, I was like, that's the moment where I see the point of this, just being able to like pay the hospital or like get a check, to, get a, get a proper healthcare, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, my parents got broken into and being able to buy them like new locks for their doors so that they wouldn't get broken into again is, is one of those things where you go, that's what this is for. Yeah. That's what's, that's, that was the feeling. Yeah. It, uh, ma it makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? Completely. Do you, do you ever feel, again, name drop, but I spoke to Gervais about this because I was oh. really, I was really, something that plagues me, whether it's right or wrong, is I feel guilty about having money. I feel, I feel this sense of guilt where it's like, and I don't have I don't have crazy money. Like I've, my mm. situation is, I paid off my house. I have a bit more in the bank. Like that's what it is. But I, I because because of my upbringing and where I'm from, and I see my dad wake up at five a.m. every morning, go work in a factory for twelve hours, and then still struggle to buy Christmas presents. And then I'm like you just said, I go online. I don't look at the price of things anymore, mm. and it, I just buy it. And then it's like what? Like this doesn't make sense. I'll tell you a quick story. Free. Four years ago, my dad's dad, my granddad, he passed away. He he got um, bone cancer or some kind of shit cancer. <laughs> They're all shit, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, he, I went to his funeral, went to the wake, had a few jars, went back home, went on a night out, and I was in the place called the Waterfront in Norwich, which is where I always I always go. Uh, 
I go there because I'm comfortable because everyone knows me there now. So I don't get the dickheads come over and whatever. But so they've, if, if Jack mates in there, they've already seen Jack mate a hundred times. So it doesn't matter. And this guy, and I was, I was gone and I was not in a good place. And this guy came up to me and said, I'd never met him before. And he asked me how much I earn from YouTube. And I think it's such a rude question, but mm. I can understand the intrigue in it because it's a world that people just don't know. It's a new world. I barely know it. And um, he asked me and I just told him, for the first time ever, I was like, this is what I earn. I said, what about you? What do you earn? And he told me, and it was like 10% 10, 10 of what I earn. And I said, and what do you do? He said, I work in the cancer ward at the hospital. And I was just like, and I weren't saying, what do you do to be rude? Mm. I was just throwing that back at him. And I remember just thinking, <sighs> it just hit me, it just got a lump in my throat. And I thought, why, why do I, do I deserve this, what I have? When there's these people that are like, they're the fucking angels. They're the ones walk, walking around doing that. Like I just, yeah, I struggled to then wrap my head around why a brand would pay me 30K to do a video. Like it doesn't, hmm. it, to me, it, it's weird. So I guess you could argue, why don't you give it all to charity? Well, I'm not going to do that, but I will give it all to my fucking family and mm -hmm. I will give it all to my fucking kids. And that's what makes me proud. Is there, this is like a wider point about imposter syndrome. Is it? I, I, I think so because um, because I've never struggled with the idea that I didn't deserve what I'd created. And I think, so I'm asking myself why you would really struggle with that. Why you might struggle with the thought that you're making money and other people are potentially having to, because I mean, it's a reality of the world. Even if you go back to where I was born in Africa, people in the fields for 18 hours a day picking tea leaves in the baking sun get paid nothing. And in the Western world, some people can just play around on their computer and make billions yeah. from, the, from the stock market or the markets or something. Mm. But for some reason, you struggle. You struggle with this and other symptoms of imposter syndrome from what I've read. In Maybe it's... Because I think I've spoke positively about YouTubers and my peers and stuff, but there's still a lot of them that are pricks. Like, and, 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 and growing up and seeing... Like I'd used to go to YouTube events and see my YouTube heroes and they'd come over. How many subscribers you got? It's the first thing I'd say. How many subscribers you got? My name's Jack. Nice to meet you, dickhead. Like, mm. so, so I guess I guess maybe it's connecting that. I'm now a YouTuber. I'm now, I, I now make my money in the same way that Alfie Days make, made his money. Ollie White makes his money. I'm that guy. And because I've seen a lot of YouTubers take it for granted and just assume that that's their right to have these things, it, that's maybe where I get my guilt from. I never want to lose lose touch of that. And and you really come from a working class like household where you've watched your dad work really, really hard and everyone around you, it sounds like, work really, really hard wherever you've looked. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you found a bit of a cheat code or, you know, yeah. it might feel like life has given you, I don't know. But you've you earned it. I mean, you bought the whiteboard. Yeah. Right? This yeah. was intentional. Yeah. The yeah. whiteboard shows that. You, you know, you planned it out. Mm-hmm. Obviously, moments of luck for all of us appear when we we start we carry on carrying on. But you realise that you've earned it, right? Yeah. You do. You hesitated. <laughs> you don't do. You? I I I do, and I, I but not to the level in which I've got to now. Not to like. Yeah, I get. I I guess. I guess. I I I have. I have. I have a talent. I can do. I'm a personable person. I can. Hmm make people laugh but yeah I don't I, I don't know I, I don't I really don't know how to answer it I get I've thought about it a lot I've racked my brains a lot about this and what does um, your brain say to you when you rack your brain don't know it's just maybe maybe may, maybe I don't but then like it's 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 cool things like this like Stevie White my my podcast co-host was working in boots nothing wrong with that it's a respectable job um just a nine to five he didn't particularly enjoy it um so I call him up one day and say let's do a podcast a year later, he's interviewing Ricky Gervais, Johnny Knoxville, Rob Bride, and he's left his job. He's doing it full time. Fiona, my partner, she was working at a supermarket. I was telling her for years, bin it off. I'll teach you how to edit. You become my editor. A couple of years go by, she bins it off. She's now working for me. There's a few examples of people in my life that can now have an easier life mm. because of the foundations that I put in seven years ago. Mm. That's, that's, what I love and that's when I'm like I I I just des I deserve this and the people around me deserve it
Does that make sense? Of course it does. Once again, you said that like the most fulfilling thing for you is helping others, right? Mm. You said that about your family with your yeah. money and now also for professionally, it's like giving those people opportunities to live a better life. Yeah, we're just a fucking team. Yeah. We're just a team. They help me as well. It's not just me going, look, I can help you do mm. this. I showed them that there's a there's a different world out there because people like us, we've been in this world for so long. We've mm. seen the opportunities, but they probably didn't. So yeah, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without the, that that kind of, the, the team in the in the background or sometimes in the foreground with people like Stevie. But yeah, um, that's a fucking cool feeling. Everybody, um, everybody, it sounds like, it feels like everybody that's not a YouTuber, and I say everybody, because there's gonna be people listening that are driving up and down the country right now as they're listening to this or, you know, doing the dishes or whatever and perfectly happy with whatever they're doing. But a lot of young people want to be YouTubers. Mm. And the thought that you had this like big main channel with mm -hmm. like, how many subs has your main channel got now? It's like 1.4 or something. Yeah, yeah? 1.4 mil, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that you would like lose motivation to do it mm. is quite a difficult concept to understand for a lot of people. You have 1.4 million people that have subscribed to get videos from you and you're like, can't be asked. Yeah, it's not so much can't be asked. It's just, it's not me. It's just, it's just not me anymore. It's people, I, I'd open up my inbox and people would be emailing me about some YouTuber from France who has sold a pen for a bit too much money and I need to be the guy that calls them out and it was just like I was never I was never really this guy so yeah I, I guess I guess I just transferred all that energy that I was putting into the main channel into the podcast and that's where my passion is now and doing stuff like this getting mm. to sit here chat to you and yeah that's I, I, I get what you mean like if you'd have asked me two years ago oh, am I just going to leave a channel with 1.4 million subscribers stagnant I would I'd call you all the names under mm. the sun. I'd be like, you're an, you're an idiot. Of course I'm not going to do that. But it seems that I have done it. I'll use it every now and then. Like in January, I uploaded a video about Boris Johnson. Mm. And I saw a dope video thank you. all over the newspapers. Really, really cool video. Thank you. Like creatively, culturally relevant. It really like hit, and it was fast. Mm. You were very quick to act on that moment. So it was, uh, that I guess, I guess for you probably, is that how you, you're seeing the use of your YouTube, your main channel now? Like when you genuinely feel you want to do something. Yeah. 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 When mm. like, when the the why is there when there's a clear and obvious why i'll mm. I'll, I'll do it um and not just for a quick buck now i'm very thankful i don't need to do them anymore it's hard to sustain something when it's not in line with who you truly are yeah it, it's hard to like sustain it for a long period of time in the short term you could probably do it but it tends to be the case when i say it with people that at any point in their lives where they were living outside of themselves like living someone else's life or kind of like fern cotton said it like she had to like go on radio and be this happy da 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 and um, almost play a character. Jake Humphrey said it to me as well, like because he was a presenter, having to kind of like put on the mask, eventually it becomes a really heavy mask to, to yeah. wear. And they all have eventually, it seems kind of choose to throw it away and just rebound. And that seems similar to what you're saying. 100%, yeah. I I, I told this story last night to someone. I can't remember. I, I used to turn the camera on I used to go, I'd be sat there and I'd turn the camera and I'd go, right guys, hello, it's me, Jack May. Oh, Zoella, oh, what a dickhead. Oh, she's done this, done that. Turn the camera off, just sit there. And I couldn't tell you anything I'd just said in the last 20 minutes. I'm just looking down at my script. She said this in her book, but how out of touch is it? And it would just be like, right, that's the ad revenue sorted for the month. Fee, let's go to Weatherspoons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it was like you can, you can only do that for so long before you just hate yourself <laughs> there is an element of that in me like that 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 the advent calendar video i've done some videos i'm really proud of funny videos when when it was when it was justified but there's also ones it's not so much i've been doing recent sort of commentary videos over the last two years my my recent ones are like videos i've been doing with my friend alfie indra who's a mu musician and we've been like sort of taking kind of comical pokes at people like um jeremy lynch from the f2 and people oh, yeah. like that and and i people think i'm jeremy lynch all the time oh really time. you do <laughs> you don't want to be you don't want to be that guy <laughs> you can be billy be the other one he seems all right but um but the thing with those videos i'm really proud of them still and i guess you could argue well you're that same kind of like scathing um commentator yeah but they i i believe that the, those people i'm going for there are justified so hello not so much. Let her crack on. You know? What would you say to her if she was... Have you ever met her? Never met her. I don't think she wants to meet me. <laughs> That'd be an awkward one, wouldn't it? Is there like... Is there any... 
Because that video did really well. Yeah. And I think if a video about me had gotten 6 million views, um, I think I'd have a pretty shitty month. I was going to say week, but I think it lasts last longer because that video did really, really well. Mm. I remember like sometimes someone will write like an article about me and I try and be this tough guy. I don't give a fuck, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm still at like 1am in the morning. It'll like, it, it's hard to get it out of my mind. Mm -hmm. So I think if a video had got 6 million views about me criticizing something I'd done, yeah. it probably been quite hard to take mentally. Yeah. Do you have, does, has that ever like crossed your mind? Like ever? Yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. saying what you did was wrong because mm. I watched the video and I actually thought it was really funny. So it's like, was there comedic merit in someone that's super successful selling a advent calendar of that n nature for that price? Yes, I understand it. Like when you talk about the why and the Gervais like philosophy, I get it. But does, does has that crossed your mind as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, like that's just another reason why I stopped doing it. Um, it it's hard to. For, for, oh, I'm not articulate enough to describe how I feel about it. But yeah, the the calendar video was funny. There was a clear error on her behalf and I just ultimately I I wasn't really saying anything nasty about her it was just this product whereas when you do a follow-up video and a third video where's the where's the line where do you draw the line is it becoming bullying now like that's not who I want to be I want to be a comedian so so that I definitely as I've gotten older and I guess maybe I was immature for a long time I should have realized this at a way earlier age than I did but you do start to consider others mm. um and and i'm the same as you mate i'll read a comment about me on twitter and i will clap back and i still go back to them now and fee's there going what are you doing and i'm like fuck them like i'll just like that's a bit of my dad as well like and i'll just i'll, sp I'll spend hours arguing with football twitter <laughs> all the worst yeah yeah and they've all got like a football player as their display picture yeah right? yeah <laughs> they're called like fantastic four nows or something <laughs> <Yeah>. like that <laughs> he doesn't know who you are <laughs> fucking hell yeah but I, I I get a bit of a rush from it, really. <laughs> I I I worry sometimes because I say to myself, I'm trying to reply to a troll to try and disprove their point, or because it's fun or whatever. But mm. I think sometimes it's because it's like hit me in the ego. Yeah, and I don't want to admit to myself that that person's actually pissed me off. Yeah, <laughs> so I kind of use the guise of no, it's funny, or like no, like to to justify it to everyone else like i'm not bothered but, yeah. you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. i really i really you know the internet is not a good place to be if you haven't got control over that because you'll get dragged around by trolls with egg emoji accounts like yeah 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 i i, I, I like i said fee's always telling me not don't shit i'll be in bed like that hungover or whatever sunday morning going on mm. and fee will be like just leave it they're fucking idiots. And ultimately, I know they're probably just jealous of whatever it is. Like, I'll get like a good podcast guest on. And uh, like the other day, I, I was in um, I was in Wales with Gerwin Price. He's the number one darts player in the world. And um, put a picture up of me and him. Just, just put, uh, in beautiful Wales, throwing a few arrows with Gerwin Price. And Gerwin Price is this panto villain. I don't know how much you know about darts, but he's like the panto villain of darts. Is he darts. the Welsh one? Yeah. That, that when he wins, always like... Then he smacked their, their bum and he goes like this, yeah. big biceps. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and 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 so he, I, I'd heard for a while that he's he's always he's very lovely off camera, but or off the stage. But when he's up there, he's a panto villain. I was mm. like, that's pretty much like the Jack Mate of Darts in a way. So I put up this picture of him. I was like, never judge a book by its cover. Like I know this more than I, I know this myself because I always did. It's just just this guy replied two bell ends. As well. <laughs> but he follows me just follows me so it was like i i will reply to him and fee's like why are you bothered like that must just be jealousy like why else are you well you follow me and you're and you're doing that like it doesn't make sense but i i kind of like i like to think that i'm very very honest online mm. so why would i not reply why would i not try and think of some pithy remark to try and put him down like yeah, because I'm meant to be a professional and I'm in this world and I'm working for West Ham. But really, I also think you're a bit of a dickhead, right? And I'll tell you. Do you think that because you are very like, um, I imagine if like Boris Johnson and like, I don't know, another politician uploaded a fit photo, you'd probably re quote retweet it and say two bellends. So like, do you think there's a chance? Because I, I don't think anyone would ever tweet me that. Like, right. if I, because, Do you think there's a, because you've cultivated a younger male audience that are comedic and they're like, they use kind of kind of colloquialistic, funny language like bellends. Yeah. You, you're also now at the mercy of them attacking you with the same language in that situation. I'm just wondering why no one would ever tweet me if I t uploaded a photo and go two bellends. 
I just, my audience just don't speak like that. Wait until this episode goes yeah. down. Yeah. Like comment. The top comment is too balanced. <laughs> yeah. Do you see what I mean? Like, and then you're having to deal with that because... I get yeah. what you mean. Yeah, but then maybe they see a bit of... Because I... Was, yeah, they, yeah. Want, they think you'd maybe like that as well. They think, oh, Jack, you know, because he follows you and he, you know, he clearly looks up to you if he's following you and, that's, and stuff. That's true. It's true. It becomes more real when you like... When like someone... some There'll be people out there that will defend me on that thread and they'll say you don't know him and he'll go, well, he looks like a prick. Look at his trousers. And then oh, it's like, okay. so it's then like, it's personal. yeah, it, go, it goes a bit, it goes a bit deeper then. But like, you are right because I, I would always do um, an event called Summer in the City. It was the only time oh. I'd ever, I'd ever get out of like Norwich and go and meet the fans. And they'd put you in a pen and there'd be all these YouTubers in this big hall at like Excel and you'd be in a pen and then fans would come up one by one. And I'd, I'd meet like 13 year old girls you might want to bleep this, I don't know, but they'd come up to me and go, all right, you can't. And I'd be like, what have you just said? And then, but then because that's what I'm doing online, all right, you fucking dickhead. But they're there to meet me and they want their thing signed. So they like me, but they think, like, <laughs> but, then I, <laughs> but then I wouldn't go up to like, I wouldn't go up to Declan Rice and start doing keepy up <laughs> around the world. All right, Declan? Like, oh my God. So then you just, I just have to be like, yeah, maybe. I am an influencer. Fuck. Scary. Scary notion. No one's ever said that to me in a meet and greet. Um, <laughs> that's so inter it's really interesting. And do you, there's an element of your, your, do you think there's an element of your childhood in that? In, in the sense of like being triggered a little bit by what people are saying or cr the criticisms that, you know, it triggers you maybe. Because I, I definitely, I'm thinking about myself. I definitely wouldn't sit in bed replying, especially now I'm on the BBC. Like BBC One is a bit prestigious in it. I can't really yeah. be popping off too much. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, probably. I probably shouldn't be either. Do you, do you, do you want to be the type of person that doesn't? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I can't, Steve. I can't. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll reply to them, and then, and then Fee will be like, delete them, and then, I, and then I, I'll be like, no, not going to. And then in an hour, it's like. It's like a come down. I'm like, all right, now I'll delete them. And then, and then in an hour later, someone else has said something. What do you mean? I'm so mature on Twitter. It's, on, it's a joke. There's a real risk there of being like pulled around emotionally though by the external world, right? Yeah. I've deleted, I've, I've deleted Twitter off my phone a few times. Um, yeah, we went, I went out for a dinner with Max Fosh and um, I told him about, he was, he questioned it. He was like, why do you always go back at these idiots? I'm like, oh, I just find it funny or they just get to me. And I deleted Twitter off my phone and he was like, I, I said, I'm going to do it for the whole weekend. And he was like, I guarantee that you'll, you'll re-download that by the end of the meal. And I had, <laughs> I did, and I was scrolling there looking through it. So when football Twitter say, we're in your head, mate, nine times out of 10, you are in the head, but I'll try and get back in yours. <laughs> do you not think it would be a happier life just to fucking <laughs> like? 100%, yeah. Yeah, but I guess I get bored. Is it that? Yeah. Quick one. As many of you know, I've been trying to make my life a little bit more sustainable as it relates to energy ever since I sold my Range Rover Sport and bought an electric bicycle. And my energy, as a sponsor of this podcast, is one of the brands that make that transition much, much easier. They are at the forefront of British renewable eco smart technology, and their products are really, really changing the game. If you're on YouTube, you can see what I'm holding in my hand. This is called the Eddy, right? It's the UK's number one solar power diverter. So, what is a solar diverter. It's a device for people like you and me that means you can divert your excess energy back into your home rather than back into the grid, which will save you power and money. It's super user-friendly and easy to install, and you can control it using the My Energy app on your phone. To find out more about this product and more products like it that will help you make that sustainable transition, head over to myenergy.com and... Um, I highly recommend you check out that Eddie. It's um, it's a real game changer for a product and one that I'm going to be installing in my home soon. Happy hour. So this was a really pivotal moment for you. Where, where did that start? Why did you decide to start doing long, long form podcasts instead of the the other types of videos you were making before? I've I've always wanted to interview people at college. Ten years ago, I, I studied interview techniques. Really, my, my granddad was the first person I interviewed. He came in and I interviewed him about the war and all that kind of stuff. And I always wanted to do it. And then in twenty. 17 i had a podcast with my friend tom norris um done, done all right uh but it was just too much too, too much um 
we were doing it at the YouTube space and we'd rock up sometimes and they didn't have the cameras in and that. So it fell by the wayside. But then uh, 2018, I wanted to do another podcast. I said to Fee, I said, who shall I do it with? Because I always knew I wanted to do it with your every man. So not a YouTuber, because that's not, I'm not a YouTuber that's been friends with YouTubers. I'm a YouTuber that's friends with my mates in Norwich. I'll do the best video ever with the big celebrity come back to Norwich and they'll just go, yeah, we didn't watch it, mate. Not bothered. And I'll just be in the pub and that'll be everything I need to keep me grounded. Yeah, yeah. So I, so she, she suggested Stevie White, who's um just a, just a mate that lived in Bristol. And, uh, I called him up and said, do you want to do a podcast? And he said, why? I said, good point. Why? <laughs> good, good point. And then we, and we ended up giving it a go. I started doing it with a guy called I'm Alex, who's a, who's a YouTuber that was very, um, a comment, he was a commentary YouTuber. So he was calling out people. He mm -hmm. would do the cookie cutter templates of like X, Y, and Z needs to be canceled. X, Y, and Z needs to be canceled. And he was doing that all the time. So originally my show was a YouTube drama show to call people out to be an extension of what I was doing on the main channel. And then after about five or six episodes, I thought this is just poisonous and I don't, it's not me. Why am I trying to do it in a different format? So we dropped that and started getting guests on and interviewing people. And I found the love of YouTube again, which I'd, which I'd lost for a few years. Was there like a pivotal moment in happy hour where you thought, fuck, this is going to be, was it, it wasn't the Spotify did it, it must've come sooner than that. Right. Where you thought this is, we've got something here. Yeah. Um, Again, it was probably getting Gervais on. Oh, God, he I was, remember that day. He, he was in our first, like, three guests. Nice. And and I'm so grateful that he gave me a chance years ago because I would I, I genuinely believe I would have none of this if it wasn't for him giving me a shot. And I built up a connection with him years ago. So he then, when I needed someone big to come on the podcast, he would step in. And you know what it's like? You get one through the door. Other people almost then don't judge the show based on me. They'll judge it based on who who else is sat in that seat. Yeah. So, so I owe I, I owe a lot to him. So that was probably a defining moment and testament to Stevie as well because I've been doing this for 10, 12 years. I've been around people like Gervais. I've been very lucky, very fortunate, and I remember how nervous I was the first time I sat on the sofa with him. The first time I filmed with him was the most nervous I've ever been for anything in my life. And then Stevie White is come literally seemingly out of boots the day before and then he sat there with Ricky and he's just he just gets it he's just on and he's just the glue and I was like I've chosen the right person here like to do this this journey with and then the money side of things so eventually you, you get approached by Spotify and mm -hmm. they they offer you um a contract or a deal exclu exclusive deal to do and I remember watching your video announcing that yeah and you were very very honest <laughs> a lot a of too honest were, no like I think that's probably why people like you so much because you're, I can trust you because you're going to tell me the way you go, listen, we're, you know, the money is a fucking a very important thing here. And you've been very um, mm. overt about that, which I think is admirable because again, it builds trust. People don't have to like what you're saying, but they're going to trust you. Mm -hmm. They're going to trust you to always be honest with them. So um, what was your thinking around the Spotify deal? Because, you know, I don't know, someday Spotify might approach me and ask me if I want to, um, if I want to go Spotify exclusive and maybe you can give me some advice on that. Um, I, the reason I did it was purely financial. I thought it was going to be a bad idea. And I took some, my network who I'm signed to, they wanted it to happen because obviously they've got a slice of the pie. Did they, did they orchestrate the deal? Or did, the, did Spotify go to them and then to you? Yeah. Okay. And um, originally I saw it as, okay, I'm taking off the full visuals episodes on YouTube and just putting them on an audio based platform. Whereas a lot of my audience might be the younger kids and people like me and you, we probably consume a lot of just audio when we're on the go and in the car and that. Whereas I think younger generations, and I'm basing this on nothing, you probably know better than I do, but I imagine younger kids probably like the more visual, they like to watch the I YouTube. So. so I thought taking it off is, is, is probably going to get a lot of backlash. And then Spotify told me how much it would be per year and the potential for how many years. And I thought, well, that doesn't just change my life. That changed my children's life who don't even exist. So I literally did it because I was financially driven. Um, and I, I, I've i got no qualm saying that or admitting that. But what I'll also say is I, now I'm starting to see the benefits a year in of going with Spotify. And they're not, they've not got a gun to my head. I can be as honest as I want about it. If I thought it was shit, I wouldn't have then signed on for the second year. But they are now pulling out guests for us. Um, that I would have never been able to pull on my own. Up until like two months ago, I'd booked every single one of my guests personally on Twitter DMs or Instagram or whatever. The last few months, they've booked us 
Johnny Knoxville as part of his jackass um, press junkets. Um, Rob Brydon, Russell Howard. Um, we've got talks of some big, the biggest movie stars in the world because of Spotify. So as somebody who has always wanted to sit down with the most interesting people in the world and pick their brains, they've offered, they've allowed me that. So, mm. uh, and they've also said that I can get the full video on Spotify if I want. And the only reason I'm not doing that is for a few things behind the scenes that I need to, uh, well, I can say it, can't yeah, I? It's because yeah, yeah. I'm earning money on the YouTube clips. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you need you to give need me to, a little bit more yeah, to take, of course, to take yeah, that yeah. off. So it needs to be worth your while. Yeah. Yeah, so I've actually had a conversation with Spotify about that as well, about that video thing. And I was I was considering it. Spotify have said um, to me, do I want to move the video to Spotify as well? Right. And again, me and Jack were trying to weigh up what that means. Does that, because we're not going to get paid for that on Spotify, but would our, would that, does that mean we'd lose YouTube viewers if we moved it there? Would people, and we kind of concluded that we wouldn't because we think that, as you've said, they're kind of very different types of people. Mm. The YouTube watcher is not the necessarily the Spotify. Right. People seem to be in their habits. They're like cycles of how they consume content. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So we've been debating that. But yeah, but then I don't know because if I'm listening to one of your apps, I'll put, I'll put, yeah, I'll put the YouTube version on even if I'm not watching it. Same. Yeah. Same. Yeah. But then if it was, if it was on Spotify, would I then go to Spotify for that? Like, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I honestly do not know. I, li I like the arrangement I have now where the people can watch the little clips on YouTube yeah. and listen to the full ones on, on Spotify. Yeah. It's like um, advertising as well, isn't it? Because that can go like viral on YouTube and then that brings people over to watch the full thing. Yeah, for sure. Which makes a lot of sense. What's your big vision as it relates to like the next five, 10 years for Happy Hour? Um, we, I want to do a live show. Oh, really? Yeah, we've been contacted a few times about doing a live show, but it just has to be right. We, we actually did like a, a like a pilot one in London somewhere a few years ago, but it was the old show with Alex and oh, the Moon. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I, I, yeah, I want to tour it. Um, I want to have a more official chat show. I don't know what that means because I have a chat show. But is that on television? I don't know. Is it? I don't know. I want a better studio. I just want to keep... I'm really fucking happy, mate. So I just want to keep doing what I'm doing mm. it, and, and just make it bigger and better and just see what happens. Every, uh, I, Thursdays, which is today, a day of recording, like, are my best days of the week. Like, I used to live for the weekend to get pissed and go out with my friends. Now I live for Thursdays because I love... Like, after this, we've got Go and Price on mine and then you're coming on mine as well. And, like, I'm so excited for both conversations. Like, that's... So I just want to keep doing it. I say it's the most impossible question when people ask me mm. where do you want to be in five years. I, I want to be. I want doing to be here. Video. Yeah. One of the things that um, you've also been really open about, especially in 2019, I saw you talking a lot about this. Was that, that was a really tough year for you, right? And you talked a lot about your sort of mental health battles and just not feeling so good. Yeah, I, was, I struggle with um, health anxiety and OCD, yeah. and I remember that was a time when I was I was really really low. Um, and again, I think I've touched on it a few times, but probably going out a bit too much and doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. And and that, that it goes hand in hand, isn't it? You feel shit because the OCD is consuming you. So you go out to get pissed up to have a break. But then the next day is anxiety or whatever they call it now is um, twice as bad. So yeah, tw 2019, I think was really when that started to get really bad. And I still have it now. Um, it's never going to go away. But it's a really weird, really weird thing to to deal with health anxiety yeah so when i was when i was 13 i found a lump downstairs and um like I, I found that like with with certain words like testicles balls stuff like that i struggle to say them i physically struggle to say them when i'm talking to, to fiona i'll say the t word or whatever and because i i remember i was up all night worried that i had the c that I, I was panicked and I was so fucking nervous. I remember going to the doctor and he had to check it out and said, oh, it's fine. It's just a cyst, it will go away. And it never went away. And I still have it now, but the health thing's like, this is how mad it is. I can't touch that part of my body. I can't look at that part of my body. I can't go that. There's probably 15 to 20 times a day where I actually convince myself that I have cancer. That, 
That's how that's how crazy it is. It's coming. It comes in. It, it comes in waves. The best way I can explain it to people who don't have it is: I don't smoke weed. I I, I have done in the past, but like I assume you've 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 smoked oh, weed. Yeah. 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 Um, for me, I can't smoke it because I lose my head. So you know that moment when your brain sort of floats off and you stop being conscious. So you're conscious, but you stop having your, you're not as alert. And then suddenly you become back to reality mm. for a few seconds. That's what my brain does with cancer. So because I had that that trigger when I was younger, that's really given me this kind of disorder, so, so to speak. And then, and then that OCD has grown and taken so many different tangents. My granddad who's on my, this arm, my, my best mate and my best man, he'll be my best man at my wedding. He, um, he got ill with septicemia when I was like 14 and I got home and my mum had told me that he was in the hospital. And I remember I went and saw him, went home. I had a picture of him and he was holding me when I was a baby on my wall and I, my lucky number's 13 and I kissed it 13 times. And then a couple of days later he got better. So that fucking triggered me. And then, it, and then I could not go to sleep without kissing it 13 times. I've never been a religious guy. I've, I've actively always spoken about my atheism, probably because I was trying to be a B-Tech Ricky Gervais. But they are my beliefs still now, or lack of. And I made up a prayer in my head. And I, it, it, I, and I, I knew it, it was like, it's, it's embarrassing to say it out loud, but it was like, dear God, please look after my mum, dad, nan, granddad, sister, and then I'd name them all. And then I, I'd have to say it three times. And even though I wasn't saying it out loud, if I tripped over a word, even thinking it, like I thought of the wrong word in the wrong order, I'd have to go back and do it again. I went to have a sleepover around my friends and then halfway through the night realised, fuck, I haven't kissed that photo of my granddad. So I had to go home. Like that's how, how mad it is. And now luckily with the numbers and the patterns and the sort of more the sort of more known about aspects of OCD, if you will, um, the more documented parts of it. I don't necessarily have those. I obsess over time and sunsets and sunrise, which is weird. But the cancer thing is something that really consumes my life. And if anyone, if, if there's an advert come on for cancer research, I have to shoot up and turn it off. And it's it's alarm bells in my head. Ding, 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 ding. To, yeah, there's been a few times during this, this chat where my brain's gone off and it's like, oh, you've things like oh if you you need to write a will or oh how's what are people what's gonna happen to the channel when you die like eh, all the little things yeah it's a weird it's a it's a strange thing but i spoke about this with joe weller on my podcast and i've had hundreds of people dm me on instagram saying they have a similar thing and although i don't reply to all of them i try and get my way through as many as i can it's deep that isn't it yeah, it, but you know, on one hand, it was because it's 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 not a world. I'm thank I'm thankful it's not a world that I that I know. But I was sat there thinking, oh my god, then you can't be the only one mm. that's going through that. And I and it's so amazing that you're so honest about that because it, there'll be people listening to this right now that go, that is me. Mm. And I'm that the concept of health anxiety seems so alien to me. But 15 times a day, you said thinking about cancer or death or mortality. And it's not the prospect of you might have it. It's my brain telling me I do have it. There's no other outcome. It will be, I'll be chatting to you now. And then it, for a minute, my head will be going, oh, remember you've got, remember you, you're ill. You're, yeah, oh shit, right. Okay, I need to deal with that at some point. And then it's almost like a, that, that moment when, you, when, you're, when you're high and then you come back down and it's, it's, what the fuck? And then I'm back in. There's a rapper called NF who struggles with OCD. And he talks about them, he puts it into kind of like, he says they're like black balloons that he's carrying around in his brain. Hmm. And every now and then one will float, float away or come back. And I really resonate to that. If anyone out there has got health anxiety and, and, and resonate with some of the stuff that I'm saying today, I, I, check, out, check out NF. He's got a few songs about health anxiety and OCD in there. It's pretty, um, it's pre it's, it, they're pretty good. They're pretty accurate. How does someone go about... Um overcoming these things or curing them is it therapy is there is there other resources that they can seek i have i've never been able to do therapy in terms of because i because i don't truly know if i'm ill or not um i can't bring myself to get walk through the doctor's door because if he if i get that confirmation i melt down i probably fucking do something silly like i don't know like so I don't want that confirmation so I'm the worst person to answer that because I would actively encourage people to go and 
if they have a worry, like go and get a lump checked out. Of course, why would you not? Or, or if you have, if you know you have this health anxiety, OCD, whatever mental disorder it may be, I would actively encourage people to go and talk to someone, whether that be therapy or whatever. But I can't do it, so I can't practice what I preach. My friend Liz, she bought me an OCD workbook, and I go through that every now and then and answer the questions and write things. And yeah, so it's a hard one for me to answer because I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to practice what I, what I actually preach. So you're you're too fearful to go and get a health check done. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It's like shop shut has come down in my brain like that because if I go there and the doctor's like, yeah, you're ill, then that's the end for me. There's no recovery process. That's it. And that's a mental thing. I know that's not the right thing. Fiona gets upset when she hears that, but I can't. Maybe it will change when I have kids. What do you mean that's the end for you? I can't live with knowing I'm ill. So even because I've, I've, I've put so much time and effort into believing it myself, my little breaks now are when I'm like, actually, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. If I ever got that confirmation, I would, I would shut down. I would. But it's, that's why it's a disorder. That's why it's not right. It's weird. Living with, living with those thoughts is, um, is not an easy thing to do. Have mm-hmm. you found yourself... And I, my business partner, you know, you've met Dominic Gregg, mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. work with him. He went through a number of struggles, which he's been very open about. And he turned to alcohol as a way to kind of like self-medicate. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming downstairs when we lived at the Mickledore. Don't know if you ever came to the Mickledore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in Manchester and finding him in, in the early hours of the morning, just drinking with the lights off at like 3 a.m. Yeah. And then thinking like, oh, this guy's just a pisshead, whatever. Mm. Finding out years later that he had like some severe anxiety, suicidal ideation. He used to stand on the train station, he said, and considered, you know, jumping in front of the train and stuff. Mm-hmm. Did you ever find yourself medicating to try and escape some of these thoughts or realities you were living yeah I still do it now I still do it now I I I will go out and drink with my mates and it's not a big problem now and nothing to worry about and if it was I wouldn't be sat here telling you about it Mm. but I would go out and drink with my mates and then I would come home and carry on just drinking on my own because the OCD, the balloons fly away and then I feel the shop shutter goes up and I've got this release that I've not thought about having cancer in the past five hours because I've, I'm, I'm, I've let loose on, on booze and then I'll come home and then start to sober up and don't want that. I don't want my thoughts back again. So I will sit there and I will drink more and it will get to six in the morning and the sun, that's why I, I, I obsess over sunrise as well because I, because I just... Yeah, it's just it's just a tough one. I can't. I struggle to sleep almost every night because that when I get in bed, I I think about it more and that. And then when the sunrise comes up and it's a new day and I know I have to start again, it's it's a, it's a tough one. So so I, I I obsess over sunrise times and I could probably tell you within fifteen minutes maybe when the sunrise is. I think it's probably like six fifty two right now maybe. What's the significance of the sun rising, sorry? Because I panic so much at night time, and that's when the, 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 the worst thoughts come into my brain, that I panic so much that I, can't, I cannot sleep, and I'm just in a circle of thinking, cancer, cancer, cancer. And then, and then because it's like, I know I need sleep because I need to go and interview this person tomorrow or present for West Ham tomorrow. It's an important thing. It's important for everyone. So, but I have to be on camera. I can't have bags under my eyes as well. So, so I see it as an egg timer and, and I'm like, shit, 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 shit. The sun's going to come up and then I've not had any sleep and I've got to go and perform. And so I'm, I, I'm checking my time. I, I need to know when the, when the sun's coming up. So I, I, I obsess over that. Like, and the, another OCD thing is I always have to turn my phone off on the 15 minutes. So I, I have to look at the time say it's 4 a.m., I have to see that 400 for the light to turn off before I can settle. And if I miss that and it's 4.01, well, I'm up for another 14 minutes then because I need to see it hit 4.15. Mm. Yeah, it's, weird. it's weird. And I don't mean to sound insensitive when I say that. It's weird because mm. cause I have it myself. But it is, it's an unusual thing. Um, but there are a lot of people out there that have a similar thing. So hit me up on DMs. Maybe we can have a chat. Did you sleep last night? Not really. Really? <laughs> Not, no. It's, it, if there's any talk of death in any capacity, I will relate that back to myself. And obviously I lost my dog last night. So I was just, yeah, just up thinking, yeah. It's weird because I, I, even though I, that all that, all those thoughts plague me and like this is like a therapy session for me, like talking about this because mm. I've only, Fiona has heard this a hundred times and then no one else has really heard it. But Um, Even though those thoughts plague me, I am really happy. Mm. (laughs) I just am. So last night you find out your dog's passed away Mm. and you 
that sends you into sort of a spiral thinking about death more broadly and yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that keeps you up last night. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm in a bit of a in, in a in a bit of a routine at the moment where like I've had like two three hours sleep, have a really busy day today, drive back to Norwich and then probably have two three hours sleep tonight, two three hours until I become exhausted and then I can just sleep all the way through one night and it's a reset. So like I just work until I can't anymore. But the the thing you were saying about Dom drinking at like three in the morning, like that is that is I've been that guy. I've been that guy 150 thousand times like yeah so I, I i when you said it i could i could envision him there because i've i've been him mm. the thing that you said about your drinking pattern that i could really relate to is with all my mates we'd like come home after like being in manchester or whatever and our like drinking arc if it was a graph goes like up and then plateaus because right. we're like we've had enough but what you said is that you wanted to carry on drinking because you didn't want the sober thoughts back. And that's exactly what I used to see in Dom. I used to look at him and thinking, why does he never want the party to stop? Why does he never want anyone to go home? Why does he always, it seems like once he's had one, it's a straight line upwards until he is incapable of pouring another. Yeah. Whereas I was, I would be like, I'd have three and then tail off and then want to be in bed by like 2 a.m. Right, yeah. And so, so I have mates that are like you and I'm the Dom in my group and and I can't, I could never understand the use. I could never understand how, why are you not, why do you not want to carry on? Like, like it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. It's such a release for me, such a break from my everyday thoughts. What, like, I just assume oh, everyone's going to be the same. Like, you just want to go to bed what, and lay there with those thoughts? Like, no way. Like, let's just carry on and see the birds come up. <laughs> Fiona. Mm. Tell me about that. You know, it's 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 hard enough um, having a partner anyway when you're busy and you're you know focused on building your career, as I found out. But um, when, when you're dealing with difficult thoughts, often it can make it, I guess, an exacerbating factor. So it can become more difficult. She's just the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like she's just fucking incredible. Like she will sit there and listen to me until six, seven in the morning, just every time, just talk about things. That's regardless of if I've been drinking or not, because I've. I fear that this podcast may make it sound like that's what I do all the time. It's not. Like, I will do that more frequently than most people. I probably have two of those nights a month where I stay up until the silly hours. Um, but con compared to where I used to be, it's 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 not. It's it's fine. But she will just sit there and listen. And she's not a drinker. She never drinks. Um, so she'll come out on a night out and will just be high on life, which is brilliant and beautiful. And I wish I had a bit of that. Um, I don't. So we're very much chalk and cheese in that respect. But she keeps me going. And there was a time in December where I'd stayed up too late. And uh, so it was now the early hours of Sunday morning and anxiety was running through my veins. And I said, oh, I'm not going to go to work on Monday. And I was hosting something for West Ham. I said, I can't do it. I said, I can't look people in the eyes. I said, the OCD's too much. I'm, I'm shaking, I'm panicking, I can't face it. And she said, oh, you will do it. And I said, don't force me to do it, Fee, please. I don't want to do it. She said, I'm not going to force you. She, I got up in bed and she'd uh, packed all my stuff that I needed and my laptop and f put it in the car. And then when I was ready, she was like, I've run you a bath. You're going to get a bath. And then we're going to go to London. She booked the hotel. I went to the hotel, woke up the next day, presented for West Ham, done a good job, smashed it. Went driving home the next day. I was a bit teary eyed and was like, I need you to just push me into things. Because if I hadn't have done that, I'd have just been hating myself for ages. So she's very much my rock, and uh, sounds a bit a bit cheesy and that, but I would not be making content now if it wasn't for her. What an amazing person! She's fucking beautiful, mate. Yeah, she's yeah, she's incredible. She's incredible. Some of the advice she gives me and stuff is like, and when I met her, she was having bad panic attacks, and I didn't know panic attacks were a thing. I really didn't. We was in Covert Garden and we and she just started shaking and sat, sat on the floor and I was like, what the fuck's going on here? And now she and she, and she would she would do no public kind of if I was doing any public events, she didn't want to be there, she didn't want to be whatever. And now it's completely flipped. I've brought her into my world, whether she wanted to or not. She's mm -hmm. been a byproduct of me for so long, and now I'm a byproduct of her. And mm -hmm. she's she's my backbone and she's she's got all of her anxiety seemingly under control i'm sure she'd tell me if not and she doesn't have panic attacks and now i'm that guy mm. and she's so yeah shout to fiona shout to fiona hero mm. Mm. 
It's so lovely to hear you talk with such um, admiration about her as well, because guys can sometimes, they either avoid talking about their partners or they're, they're a bit too tough to like give them the credit for the supporting role they play. Mm. But I, I think the same way with my girlfriend, who's actually upstairs now, who's been a real rock for me and a real stabilizing force and really like helped me focus on what actually matters in life. It's like really, I think with my girlfriend, she's probably, I don't know if she's even through the curtain and she can hear me, but she doesn't particularly care about what I've achieved. It doesn't seem to care at all when I, if I like, if I made, if I made loads of money, it's more about the other things, mm -hmm. like in terms of being connected to my family and being a good human being. Yeah. Those are the kind of things she drives me on. But, um, fees the same. Yeah. So, issue. Yeah. Like me and my, my family, if I go around my nans on Christmas day, we're all like, we get, like, I, lo I love my family. Of course I do, but we'll watch TV, the Christmas specials, mm. whatever's on. We'll go around Fiona's house. Her family never turn the TV on for the, for three or four days over the Christmas period. They sit there and they talk and they love each other and they embrace each other. And for me, it's I'm like, this is weird. Like this is old fashioned, like mm, old school values. Yeah, but she it smells like that. She just she's she's just so full of love and she just yeah she just brings everyone closer. She she walks into a room, she brightens it. So you want to be a dad someday? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I do. Why, why was that question difficult? I don't know. I don't, I'm, 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 I, I, we, me and Fee have spoken about it a lot. So I'm 29 now, soon, in two weeks. So I'm getting, I feel like I have to kind of soon. Um, you have to kind of soon? Yeah, I have to have a kid <laughs> soon, surely. Like, I don't, says who? I don't want to be what this, I don't want to be a dad that's like 60 when they're like 20. So like, I don't want to be, I don't, I can't have a kid when I'm 40 then. But do you want to have a kid? Yeah, I do want to have a kid. I'd be a great kid. I'd be a great dad. But ideally not soon. Yeah, I said when I was early 20s, I said by the time I'm 25. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 25, I said by the time I'm 27. And then now I'm saying by the time I'm 30. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I've got just under 13 months, so I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and Fiona's just had a, um, her sister's just had a baby. So Fiona's just become an auntie. And we love the little baby. Of course we do. But of course, hard work. Mm -hmm. And I can give it back. Mm. <laughs> does it feel a bit scary for a lot of people it's, it's quite a scary prospect for me it's a little bit of a scary prospect too because i think what am i gonna have to sacrifice to i don't want to sacrifice anything mm. we yeah. have to sacrifice something to find time right and sure when well, you're very you career driven yes yeah I, I just sort of run about from place to place mm. talking to people on a camera mm. like i could have a kid and fee could stay at home and edit but mm. I love my life so much. I don't want it to change right now. Are you going to have a kid? I, ho I hope so. Mm. I hope so. <laughs> like looking through the curtain. My girlfriend's there. What's your, um, you, you know you're talented, right, though, Jack? You know what your talent is, right? Yeah. What do you think your talent is? It's a difficult question to ask people because it makes them feel uncomfortable. But what do you, if you had to say, like, the reason I am sat here today and the root cause of my success, what would you diagnose it if you were talking about Jack, mate, from, like, a third party? perspective i think i can speak to most people on their level so you can put me next to um ksi mm -hmm. you can put me next to deborah meaden mm -hmm. and i'll be able to get a laugh out of them mm -hmm. and when they know the real me and i'm not trying to be jack mate i think that's a good i think that's a good person mm -hmm. and i've never been the best youtuber it's probably why i don't do the typical youtube anymore i'm not the best presenter but i'm one of the best podcasters mm -hmm. i would say and i've found what it is i love and what it is I'm good at. So I would say I'm a really good talker. Hmm. I, would, I would completely agree. I think you're much more talented than you give yourself credit for, actually. Thank I you. I look at some of the stuff you do specifically with presenting, actually, and podcasting, but presenting and podcasting. And it's clearly, it's almost a bit like Will Brazier, like clearly a real talent that is, in my view, like impossible to replicate. Like I, like, and you talked about potentially in the future doing some stand-up stuff. Mm. I saw you talking about that before. Mm -hmm. You'd be great at that. Thank and I you, could yeah. never do, like, I don't believe I could have, mm, I shouldn't be such a pessimistic person. You did it, you've, you've been doing big theater productions, right? Yeah, big I'm not there making people, I'm not trying to make people laugh. I'm trying to make them cry. It's like, <laughs> it's like a completely- <laughs> Yeah, but that's thing. a fine line in comedy. If you can it's make, true. if you can make someone yeah. cry, you can make someone laugh. It's yeah. all about emotions. That's what it's all yeah. about. Do you know what it is? It's like the labels we give ourselves and I've never labeled myself as like a funny person. I've never told myself that I could make people laugh, whereas you do that. You do that very, almost like effortlessly. And I think, to be honest, I think you've been practicing since you were a kid, as you said, so. Yeah. <laughs> I did um, I did two shows um, opening up for Max Fosh mm. in November, and they were the best moments 
ever. Of your life? Yeah. And that, that was stand-up? Yeah. Yeah. I feel a bit silly saying it because Max Fosh did an hour, a beautiful show. Um, and it, it, well, it was called Social Butterfly. Um, it was spelt with a Z for, for a reason that becomes clear in the show. But he, he had um, presentations and everything. And he came on my podcast. I said, oh, you're a real stand-up now. You've just done a tour all up and down the country. He was like, no, I don't feel like a stand-up because I had these aids and it was almost just whatever. And I was then I felt like an idiot because I'd just done five minutes opening up for him. And I was putting online that I've just done my dream. I've just, but I had. I had. I was... I was I was so nervous. I, I I pretty much had a panic attack before I went out. I was looking at Figo and I can't do it. Shaken, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. Had all my little jokes written on my hand really? there, but they'd already, <laughs> they'd already sweated off. And I tell you what, Steve, like I put myself down a lot and we've spoken about self-deprecating humour. Mm. I went out on stage. Max Foss just suddenly went, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Jackman. I went out. And that was what I was meant to be doing. Like I, everything any comedian had told me on my podcast came to me in that moment. And I learned that and applied it on the stage. And I had people eating out the palm of my hand and I would make a joke and I would, but when I did a bit of stand up years ago, I rushed through it because I wanted it to be over. I was in the moment and I was able to live in the moment and leave pauses and hit beats. And it was well good. I walked out and the guy in, in the front row had my merch on. So I was really? like, yeah, so oh, I was so like the there's front. one guy here that knows. So I was able to talk to him. You want to do that more? Yeah, I will do it now. Now I know I can do it. I will do it. Um, there's no, surely there's no feeling like that, like in front of people live and they're just, you know. Hearing that laugh is, I've never done heroin, but I imagine yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. it's like to do, to get that hit. Mm. And I want that I, I want that back. That was like the biggest rush that I've felt in in a long time. And are you, are you thinking about doing that? As a hap under the happy hour brand, I think I'll do a happy hour show, yeah. um, whatever that may be. But then I also want to do a stand up Jack Dean or Jack Mate mm. stand up show. Um, I've got loads and loads of stand up bits written down. I've done, I've, I've got mm. notepads and MacBooks full of full of jokes. So there's yeah. nothing like it. There's nothing like the real world. Mm. We get kind of lost in the the digital world as like content creators or whatever. But last night and the last few nights at the Palladium have been the most like uh nothing has made me feel as alive as that so okay. anyway israel uh, i should know i don't normally say this but fuck it you know israel was here yesterday so you know it's the questions from him usually we don't tell people who, who the question's from right but israel adesanya wrote a question for you okay and bear in mind this is the this is the goat of fighting right. this is the goat right <laughs> yeah he wrote a question for you he wrote and you got to answer this with total honesty that's the only rule here you got to answer it with detail he said how are you truly feeling? Content. I was going to say happy, but I still have some issues I need to iron out. So I'm content. And I feel privileged to be where I am. That's what I'll say. You probably wanted a better answer, but there we go. That's all you're getting. Perfect. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You, Steve. Thank you for your time. And I'm so glad we finally got to do this because you've been an inspiration for me. I, I think centrally because of your willingness to be so open and honest with things. And I don't think you'll ever see the impact that that openness has on thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of people. It's like, I think more people need to do need to, to find it within themselves to do that. Because you, as you've said today, it's liberating for you. Like mm. the therapy of just being able to say it mm -hmm. kind of lifts the weight, but it also lifts the weight for everybody listening. And so I applaud you for that and your self-awareness about the journey you've come on as a creator, as a man in your maturity. So thank you. It's a pleasure to sit here and thank you for the inspiration. No, thank you, mate. It means a lot. And thank you for having me on the show. It's a great no show. So um, yeah, let's do mine and we'll speak about your favorite sandwich. Let's go do it. <laughs> Bye.